this one's a prose poem again. Um, in the interest of not taking up all the time, it's um, the Consul Energy Center is where the Pittsburgh Penguins play hockey. And um, when it was brand new, and they were, you know, bringing everything in to outside, they left all the doors open, and all of these English house sparrows got in there. So if you know the history of the English house sparrow, you will know they're still in there. <laughs> and uh, my daughter loves hockey, and one of our friends is the Mario, Mario Lemieux, the owner's right-hand person. So we have this private tour of the Console Energy Center, so we know the English house sparrow story. English house sparrows and the Console Energy Center, and this is the epigraph. Without question, the most deplorable event in the history of American ornithology was the introduction of the English house sparrow, um, W.D. Dawson, The Birds of Ohio, 1903. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they snuck in when the arena opened. Loading dots beckoned the sparrow home like the first Brooklyn imports, maybe a, a pair now and then, not some mad rush of starlings swooping along the river, so many that they look like the tattered flag of a country that's forsworn color. The house sparrow, old world import, old world import, captured, purchased, transported in cages. We ignored till they overran native birds, ravaged crops window sills and hockey arenas. Our guy, Anthony, has become a sparrow expert of sorts, though not his primary mission. He's been charged to rid the arena of its one hundred <coughs> yes. Over 200 yeses. He's learned something in his quest, the house sparrow's feeding habits, breeding habits, lifespan. But all this comes to naught when he tries to kill them. What he learns is what's been learned. The house sparrow adapts. It takes what it needs from what it's given, what we leave behind, popcorn, peanuts, chips, water pooled in every hollow the arena offers. Sparrows nest high in the girders and come down when the arena's empty to feed in the aisles, perch on the best seats to watch the penguins practice skate. Our man has been tasked with eliminating the feathered rat. Had he known he'd agree with Dotson, the English sparrow must go. The bird has wrought a great deal of evil to our country chiefly. We imported the English sparrow, that was not nature's fault. We should rectify our arrow, drive out the English sparrow. <laughs> Anthony's considered many agents of death for the wily birds that fly so fly so blithely, blithely through the console sky. He's got a list of failures, antifreeze dough balls, but the birds were too cunning and popcorn too plenty. <laughs> a cat's too smart to chase birds hundreds of feet up into girders, and if the odd dumb cats did, who would get them down? The falconer decided one falcon couldn't kill enough sparrows to scare the survivors away. Falcons were more like smart bombs. They hone in on one target, scare the rest into fleeing or submitting. Falcons are assassins, not mass murderers. The English sparrow's lifespan, Anthony doesn't like to call them house sparrows. He likes thinking of them as invading from England like the beetles. He thinks it's 12 months in the wild, 24 in captivity, but living in a hockey arena is the best of both worlds. Free to fly, feed, breed, live in a temperate environment, free of all predators. So far, except Anthony, and he admits he's not been very predatory today. <laughs> Anthony, this is going to be harder than you think. As one not bent on killing them has written, note the more cordial term, house sparrows can live for several years if their needs are met. Opinions vary, but some say house sparrows can live for two, four, and a couple vote for 13 years. Do the math, Anthony, read and weep. A few house sparrows can multiply into thousands in a few years because they regularly raise three and sometimes as many as five broods per year, each brood averaging around five or six birds. Say six, maybe 10 got in those first days. Okay, they weren't prepared, didn't come for a hot date. Some had to be boys and some girls, and now you're 10 or 200. This is exponential growth. You might reduce their food supply by meticulously cleaning after every event, but your staff thinks it's doing that now. And are, are you going to dun their wages for popcorn left in the aisles? Will they have to race the sparrows to see who gets the peanuts first? 
you can't poison the popcorn. There's fans and liability if people start dying of bastard and sparrows. I thought of suggesting you blast disco at night with strobe lights, like PsyOps went after Noriega. But who knows what a sparrow loves and hates. I said no to paying circus highwear flying Zambezis to catch the birds with dip nets. Inefficient, again, high liability, especially if they insist on doing it without nets. Maybe if all 800 TVs, this is true by the way, maybe if all 800 TVs showed Court TV, the Kardashians, or the real high housewives of New Jersey marathons, but sparrows might cultivate a certain weirdness and enjoy especially shows about humans looking stupid. Consider instead Bob Marley, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Make this place an, a an aviary and an arena. Encourage sparrows to sweep through the low girder of sky, to loop and dive like blue angels after a penguin score. Or consider finally this jubilate. For sparrows are not pigeons. For sparrows sing, do not squawk, screech, or caw. For sparrows do not steal shiny baubles. For sparrows bear no omens of death. For sparrows do not eat dead flesh. For sparrows are not as dumb or loud as peacocks. For sparrows are not cuckolds. For sparrows do not hammer and bore into wood. For sparrows are not the nickname of a rival team. For all of this, you should rejoice. <laughs> and I'm going to do one more, and then Bob will read prose and challenge you to determine if it was different from what I just did. Right? <laughs> Um, my, a friend of mine, one of the really great poets, I think, writing now, Frank Gaspar, was visiting and he wrote a poem about um, where we live. And so um, I'm sort of, the, the he and the lines quoted are, are Frank. And so the epigraph is from Frank's poem. The title of my poem is Eden, but the epigraph from Frank is, We entered the house, we loved everyone, our hearts were bursting. What am I living for? No, not careless reader. Why am I living? What a poem. These few words I hope important. The joy tinged with sorrow of seeing myself unnamed in my dear friend's poem when only I knew how far we already were from paradise. What the visible was good. What I hid was coming. Now there's this, as he warned. It was about truth and beauty. But truth left us stranded when it failed. The old persimmon grew so heavy it cracked near the ground and fell fully leaved and green. I cut and stacked, though I knew there'd never be a fire. Beauty always leaves us outside. It's an idea, an emanation, which does not need to fulfill its being. Still, it was good. It made those moments of quiet awe I loved. What if this, as I suspect, is not enough? Truth, beauty, love. We all end up dead, mourned or forgotten, or both each in its turn. Shakespeare claimed, as if proved, that a lover's beauty would never fade because he had written and loved. Well, so have I, but I'm no Shakespeare, just a journeyman and overmatched by a good fastball fooled by a curve that breaks out of the strike zone. I know illusion when I see it, but soon there's nothing left but desire and I go round again. So much like Eden, he wrote, but Eden, a sort of a priori entrapment like buying Indian ponies or grass from a narc was meant to be lost. It's the providence of what I no longer know. Though I'm no stranger, no novice, there's much I don't know, like how a highway from Charleston to Portal, North Dakota can bear one number and name. He asked, all those words around our glowing heads, isn't that what we make the world with? Maybe, I would say now, maybe. Thank mm -hmm. you.